One of the biggest signs a company has messed up is when their largest advocates, the people who scream they can do no wrong, turn on them. This was the case today, the day after BE3, the Bethesda press conference. It was a divisive one. There was a lot of disappointment that comes from the fundamental misunderstanding of what Bethesda is. That's because it shares a name. There are two entities called Bethesda. And it's by their own doing that people get confused regarding which one is which. So first, we have Bethesda Game Studios, the workplace of Todd Howard, whom most people think of when they're looking for a new amazing game in their favorite franchise. They want to see Todd Howard come out on stage and tell them that their hopes and dreams are true. When people think about, talk about, and try to defend Bethesda from haters, this is the Bethesda they're thinking of. This is the Bethesda they're conjuring mental images of. This is the Bethesda they built up so many memories with. It's the game studio. These are the creators, the artists, the sound engineers, the writers, the people who make your dreams come true. Unfortunately, stuck on the front of every Bethesda Game Studios game is their publisher, Bethesda Softworks. Now, they used to be tightly knit. There used to be crossover between employees and things like that. But as the companies grew larger and larger and larger, these relationships are no longer the same. People I know in Valve and Blizzard and all these other companies that were smaller and are getting bigger can tell you that corporate culture changes over time. And this has definitely been the case within the ZeniMax family. We'll get back to the ZeniMax family concept later. But my point is that the people presenting to E3 this year were not Bethesda Game Studios. They were Bethesda Softworks, the publisher. Bethesda Softworks owns the rights to not only publish, but license out everything related to Bethesda Game Studios. As well as, of course, control over Arcane Studios for Dishonor and Prey, for id Software, for things like Doom and Quake. And they also have various support studios and third-party contractors, such as, and this, this part's fun because when people were asking, well, why are they wasting time on the Skyrim Special Edition and not putting out a new Elder Scrolls game? That was Bethesda Montreal. Bethesda Montreal is actually under the Game Studios Corporation, as far as I can tell. They are legally attached to the Game Studios. So as far as profits and losses and things like that, they, they share that realm. However, in reality, in physical reality, they're nowhere near each other. And they have, from what I can tell, almost no interaction with one another. Bethesda Montreal is a support studio. So when you ask yourself, well, what about this Elder Scrolls Legends thing? Why are they wasting their time on that and not working on my favorite game? Um, you mean Direwolf Studios? Who's working on that? Yeah, Direwolf Studios doesn't actually work on the Prime Elder Scrolls games. It's like, well, what about Elder Scrolls Online with that Morrowind expansion? Why are they working on that and not remaking Morrowind? Well, that's ZeniMax Online Studios. They're an MMO shop. Their job is to create a perpetual money machine with Elder Scrolls Online. My point here, though, is simple. There is only one Bethesda Game Studios and one group attached with Todd Howard. They're a small, tight-knit studio that is working on a specific undisclosed project. They had no influence or attachment to anything else under the Bethesda name. But that's because we're talking about Softworks. As of right now, we're dropping the Bethesda name for the rest of the video. While Game Studios is more or less on the same track they've always been since Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion, that'll probably be a topic for another video at this rate, they're chugging away on that secret project. We're hoping it's Starfield, obviously. We were hoping Starfield would be announced 
yeah, uh, unrealistic expectations, right? But yeah, that's what the Game Studios is doing right now. Now, the publisher, Softworks, they want to present us with properties not made by Game Studios, but by their holdings. Montreal, Arcane Studios, id Software, Direwolf Digital. And you can see how people built up their expectations for the Game Studios. And they got everything else. Enter Pete Hines, the man whom on Twitter may or may not have insulted fans for arguing that Jet is a post-war drug and that the X-01 power armor shouldn't be in pre-war locations. I uh, know you have to check your Twitter history for that yourself. This video isn't about what kind of person Softworks, the publisher, decides to put to represent themselves. I quite frankly didn't have time to research that. But uh, I'm sure you might find something on Twitter to confirm or deny what I just hinted at there. So first, they showed us clips of children of various developers. What does your daddy do? What does he do for a job? <laughs> Plays on his computer. I don't know. I don't know, actually. He does effects like sparkles, cutscenes. You better feel for computing. these people. No, no, if you don't feel for these people, you are a terrible human being. These are the faces behind the company. We are making ourselves relatable. We're humanizing ourselves so we aren't a faceless company that wants your money. It, like most people are going to relate to these uh, these families and see them as human beings as a result. When you have to understand that these humans merely cogs in a machine, and that machine is trying to suck your money out. So. He did, do these people provide quests? I'm really proud of my dad. Adding <laughs> 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 things out to make you ignore I'm no sure Elder Scrolls Six. Then they gave us Bethesda Land, a theme park presentation in the vein of the old Disneyland promo videos, with all the arrogance of Andrew Ryan from that Bioshock opening, or the old man from Jurassic Park. Spared no expense. It was childish. It was unprofessional. And most importantly, it oozed the insincere fabrication of a roaming carnival looking to get your money. What, what are we even watching? In They're jerking what? themselves off. Shake things up again. No, no, I'm serious. They, they have their, their virtual cock out. And they're jerking themselves off to their Bethesda previous Game accomplishments. Studios is known for creating open living worlds with seemingly limitless gameplay content. But what if there was another way to experience even more? This, all new. this is what the video game world is about. Creation yes. Club. A collection of new Self-aggrandizing bullshit. For, That's what this is. New weapons. In fact, Devolver Digital blew them out of the freaking water. <laughs> Designed to subtly convince you to give us your hard-earned money. Tomorrow's unethical business practices today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah that. Pointing out everyone at the same time. All of those other conferences have been called out by Devolver because Devolver took the piss. The deadly sin committed here during this Bethesda Land presentation was the sin of pride. Softworks the publisher stood tall boasting of their accomplishments, or rather, the accomplishments of their subsidiaries. The accomplishments of their Bethesda Game Studio. And the creators inside. The artists inside. The programmers inside. The people who worked hard for the game studios. Now, here's an inside spoiler. They're all a part of the ZeniMax family. And most of the creative forces that made up Elder Scrolls III Morrowind had the good sense to jump ship then, and quite a few of the ones who stick around, they left either during or after the development of Oblivion. Todd Howard may have been the director in name through Morrowind, but he didn't have the clout and the seniority to make it his, truly until Oblivion came out. That's why I was referred to Oblivion and Skyrim as the Todd Howard Scrolls, even if Redguard and Morrowind had the Todd Howard name affixed to them. If you listen to interviews with some of the developers who made Morrowind and then promptly quit afterward, they'll tell you Todd Howard was that kind of guy who just wants to run in and chop things up with an axe. He's never been very interested in the 
the RPG side of things. He he wants you to feel awesome, to be awesome, and the Dovahkiin was that expression of that desire. And I expect anything else made by him will probably exude that same kind of feeling. But no matter how many employees' children you put up, no matter how you cartoonize your corporate accomplishments, people will see through that. People will see through the insincerity. The ZeniMax family may have ownership of franchises. Softworks may publish those works, but anyone who's been following an author has read their novels, had the author jump off of one publisher because that publisher was treating them like shit, and transferred your favorite novel series over to another publisher. They know, that the, those fans know, that the publishers aren't the creative vision. You don't owe your loyalty to the publisher. You don't owe any gratitude to the publisher whom you are paying when you buy their stuff. Your loyalty belongs to the author, the artist, the creators, or in this case, the game studio. Sharing a name. The Softworks publisher and the game studio used to be one and the same. It made sense. They had a common origin. They had a common purpose. They were inextricably linked with crossover of people. Since then, they've grown up. And this is no longer the case. The corporate machine Softworks represents is merely an arm of ZeniMax Media. Softworks dangles its strings down and passing on thou shalt edicts to the various development studios that Softworks once served back before this evolution of corporate culture. This self-indulgent carnival of shallow corporatism was quite frankly to me disgusting. And and well, we're on the topic of corporatism. Yes, Zarek Zahakran is incorporated, so I'm a hypocrite. Turns out hypocrisy is a pretty solid business. I think uh, Total Biscuit agrees with that. <laughs> anyway, moving on. Softworks proceeded to tell us about their amazing upcoming content, and then showed us it in the form of cutscenes. Pre-rendered, no gameplay included. And while most people got angry for the lack of Fallout or Elder Scrolls games they, they, that didn't get the new iteration. I personally didn't feel disappointed by that. I, I never felt entitled to a new Elder Scrolls or Fallout game. I'll do a breakdown of E3 2017 in another video, but let's just say while in the previous video I was able to make fun of EA for all their nonsense, non-speech, where they just buzzword after buzzword after buzzword with uh, lines that made no coherent sense. If you actually just stopped and thought, analyzed what they were saying, it, it was all empty words in, in the E3 press conference. The thing is, despite all that, the E3 press conference showed actual gameplay footage. So in terms of advertisements, EA is better than Softworks this year. And I'll leave it at that. Here's what Softworks really did to ruffle feathers, though. They announced the Creator Club. The Creator Club was a way that mod makers could get paid for making mods. It promised people that mods they'd buy through the club would be compatible with their saved games, official DLC, and other Creative Club mods. In short, this would be a vehicle in order to create official fan-made DLC. Bethesda created their own premium currency, which at this point is so exploitative that I, I think it's a good argument why premium currency should be made illegal. Still, you can use that premium currency you buy on BethesdaNet by way of Steam or Xbox or PlayStation in order to purchase these official Creators Club mods. So, their FAQ may say in big bold type, this is not paid modding. But I'm going to tell you right now, the Bethesda page lies to you. They're using semantics and their own homebrew definitions to get around the fact that it is paid modding. They're using the sale of a premium currency through Steam, through Xbox, through PlayStation, in order to skirt around the fact that they are selling mods. 
because in their mind, or the way they've they've legally fabricated it, what they're doing is they are selling you premium currency that you can then use to exchange for mods. Thus, the point of sale protects them like a legal shield. And, and that is why I'm saying premium currencies are bullshit. They are selling you mods. That is absolutely certain. But they're doing it in a very interesting way, which we'll get back to. Because I'm, I'm not necessarily against this, but the way they're presenting it is extremely disingenuous. Now, before I get explaining anything else, there's one particular thing I have to cover. You see, fanboys in the Skyrim modding subreddit and certain modders on the Nexus private forums, they've been rewriting history regarding how the paid mods fiasco went forward. To sum it up, they've been inventing their own history and details regarding it. Having actually known several individuals who've worked for Valve, I'm going to tell y'all a little story. Valve was riding high off of the success of moving Team Fortress 2 to free-to-play status. Using their Manco store, they crafted a deal with a group known as Polycount. Polycount's items were officially incorporated into the game. These were previously mods, now they are official. When players used the Manco store, the modders who crafted those items would get paid on them. It was insanely successful, and Team Fortress 2 would become a hotbed for model designers, skinners, and pretty much anyone looking to leave their mark on the game as an official in-game asset in exchange for revenue sharing. Softworks, not game studios, entered into negotiations with Valve to extend this system to the Steam Workshop. Valve offered Softworks a wide range of tools in order to properly curate and manage the system. You can't just upload anything you want to the paid mod systems. And yes, there are paid mod systems running right now for Team Fortress 2, Warframe, Dota 2, more. You have to have them curated and approved by the company before they get officially implemented. Explaining how this worked to Softworks, Valve was kind of taken aback when Softworks made it expressly known that there will be no curation and that this was a deal breaker for them. Valve shrugged and said, all right, not realizing how many problems would arise from this later. Softworks would go on to launch the most disastrous out of all the paid mod systems in gaming. And in under a day, people would upload other people's mods claiming it was their own. A subreddit was established known as Mod Piracy in order to take these mods from Steam and distribute them freely among people. Various mod makers whom were contacted one month before the paid mod system went live, they did their best to make these flagship mods and they were treated like garbage. No, literally, the community attacked them. How dare you sell out and make these terrible things? After Valve and Softworks came to them and said, hey, we're offering you an opportunity to make a living doing this, to, to revolutionize the way mods are made, to make sure you get paid for it, to make this a profession so that you can just keep making mods you love. You could get, you can make what you love a job. Isn't that awesome? And so they said, yeah. And then they were given less than a month to actually make the mods when the mods were somewhat incomplete or just lacking because they weren't given enough time. Well, the community attacked the mod makers, and the mod makers felt betrayed by Softworks and Valve. After witnessing the paid mod system in action, uncurated, unregulated, Valve were the ones who called Softworks up and voiced their concerns about this. There were massive liabilities in the system as it was, uh, the images of both Valve and Softworks were tarnished just by being a part of this. And after all the concerns were voiced, the choice was made to terminate paid mods. And this decision was mutual between the two companies. There are a lot of misconceptions, rumors, lies going around regarding Valve's part in this. Saying that Valve was greedy trying to take all the money. Valve has always taken a flat 30% when dealing with third parties. That people could negotiate a smaller rate under specific circumstances, but... 
that has been normalized and now it's just pretty much 30% of all transactions. In exchange for that, Valve hosts the mod or the game or the DLC or whatever. Then they handle the credit card transaction that includes dealing with chargebacks and things like that. And they provide their platform, including the Steam store and all of this. And it, that includes the moderation, the curation tools, everything. Everything that they've developed and invested in such, all of that goes into their 30%. That is why Valve gets 30%. And so Softworks believe that they were due more than the users. And that's where the real problems came in. And again, these uh, specific mod makers on the Nexus who had visions of wanting to be able to sell their mods they resented Valve for having contacted Softworks regarding this. And that's really the problem here, is there was a lot of resentment on behalf of the mod makers. What happened to the mod makers? Well, I highly recommend you check out my video called The Nexus Problem. Over a year's worth of resentment built up and accumulated in that. That hasn't gone away. We're going to see what happens. My point here, however, is that that is the paid mod system fiasco in a nutshell. They put it up, they managed it in the most crappy way possible, and they shut it down. Now, I said back then, and I said it on live streams over the past couple years. And then I said it again in my MXR Tarshana video, and then one last time in my Nexus problem video. I said they're bringing paid mods back. No, they'd never do that. That, that didn't work out. It's, it's gone for good, people said. And you j should just go to the comments section and, and, and skim through those because it, it is hilarious seeing people's naivete in the face of actual business. Business is business, and when we see a reservoir of money that we can tap, that is the, the modding community, it's like one of those heart plugs from House Harkonnen in the Dune franchise, where, you know, they popped open the heart plug and, and drank... Holy fuck! Like, that's what they want to do with the modding community. They, they want to give all the modders heart plugs. But all hyperbolic bullshit aside, I actually am in favor of paid modding on a certain level. You see, my stipulations for a good paid modding system was, number one, that it be curated. This new system is being curated. My next stipulation was that it be held to DLC quality. Well, horse armor. Or should I say mud crab armor? I don't think that this is full DLC status here. Now where this whole DLC quality stipulation I made came from was that for Doom and Quake and various other games, third party studios, which were more or less just glorified groups of mod makers, usually just map makers along with one 3D modeler and one sound guy, they would all come together and they would make an official licensed DLC. We're talking about Scourge of Armageddon or Desolation of Eternity for Quake. We're talking about Final Doom. So when you understand that, it makes a lot more sense that in the past, actual companies had been formed in order to do licensed DLC. And these companies were fairly liberal with their licenses, provided that these mod makers had proved themselves. And I think that that's what needs to happen, is you need a team, and not just one person, but a team to work on a foul scar, or a worm's tooth, or an undeath. These large scale mods. And if you had a full team behind one of those, they could become an official DLC and it could be licensed out. This is not really what they're doing with the Creator Club. With the Creator Club, they are giving a non-disclosed deal. You'll notice that the financial details regarding the Creators Club are kept <laughs> off the page. Now, I'm very much hoping that someone will be offered a contract and then will promptly 
disclose it to everyone and decline the, to sign the contract. Uh, but, um, of course, I, I'd be afraid of what kind of legal retaliation they'd receive because, you know, something that's made in confidence. So, what we have essentially is we have a promise that they're going to curate their content. We have a promise that the mod makers who make these curated mods, but when you look at the offering that is available right now for the Skyrim Special Edition Fallout 4, we got crab armor, which is the equivalent to horse armor. Remember that DLC for Oblivion everyone said wasn't worth it and was garbage? Yeah, that's what we're seeing now on the Creator Club. If I had to guess, because I've been privy to absolutely nothing internal regarding the Creator Club, this is something brand new, I would guess that these creators were given a quick opportunity to make something small, similar to the way it was handled on the Steam Workshop. So that pretty much wraps this up. We got paid mods, they're back, they're in the form of this Creators Club, when Softworks tells you that the Creators Club is not paid modding, they're lying to you. And a generation of modders will now be able to enter into a contract with Softworks in order to get official DLC made. I'm still in favor of the foul scars and the worm's tooths and the undeaths being made official DLC for these games. I want to see that. I still want to see that. But I can't trust them because quite frankly they haven't proven themselves to be trustworthy. And with each E3, they seem to be getting worse and worse and worse. I made this prediction that they were becoming the next EA. That ZeniMax was making itself to be the next EA. With Softworks as its arm, its puppet strings controlling the smaller studios, and ZeniMax's arm, which is again Softworks, waving at an amusement park of their own creation, touting their accomplishments. My respect has turned to disrespect over the last few months of analyzing the situation, and my disrespect has turned to fairly well discussed at this point. But if nothing else, it's it's rather fun to cover this stuff just because I see everyone else getting outraged, whereas th this has not been extremely surprising to me. And I suspect very much that they won't disappoint me in the future. Softworks has already lied to us when they told us that reviewers would never be given advanced codes for games anymore. Their explanation was they wanted everyone to experience the games at the same time, including reviewers. They then promptly gave those games early to their favored sons on YouTube, influencers, whom they were almost certain would cover the game in a positive light. Not critical reviewers who might you know, actually say bad things about their products. But that was the point. That was the point. When Doom and Dishonored 2 were coming out and they told everyone, no, reviewers won't get access anymore, but we're still giving them to influencers, even though we want everyone to experience at the same time. Which is it? Do you want everyone to experience at the same time or do you want to control the message? You're a liar. No matter which one is the truth, your actions have proven that you're a liar. And they're lying right now, saying this isn't paid modding. So, what I'm telling you, right now, don't trust Bethesda Softworks. If Bethesda Game Studios wants to put out the next big thing, pay attention when Todd Howard comes up and presents his thing. Because he's probably worked pretty damn hard on it. His whole team has probably worked pretty damn hard on it. But when something just has the label Bethesda on it, don't trust it. Don't trust any corporation. Seriously. Think for yourselves. Be good consumers. Stop being stupid fanboys. Think for yourselves. If I managed to open your eyes a little bit, why don't you go ahead and give the video a like? Either way, if you disagree with me and you still think 
Bethesda Softworks is the best thing ever, uh, go ahead and leave a comment. Tell me about it. Tell me what you think about this whole situation. And maybe I've opened someone's eyes as far as uh, corporatism goes and how these people are not your friends and don't care about you, the consumer, don't care about you, the modder. They want to earn as much money as possible. And if you're absolutely insane, you can check out my Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Sahakaran. Either way, I'll be doing live streams through this E3 week on twitch.tv forward slash Sahakaran. And you can check those out if you are bored. I think, honestly, for me, this has been one of the most fun E3s I've done in a while. But I think that's because I decided to roast the hell out of it. <laughs> Keep an eye out for another E3 video, and I will see y'all next time.